The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain. Chapter Four. The Prince's Troubles Begin. After hours of persistent pursuit and persecution, the little prince was at last deserted by the rabble and left to himself. As long as he had been able to rage against the mob and threaten it royally and royally utter commands that were good stuff to laugh at, he was very entertaining. But when weariness finally forced him to be silent, he was no longer of use to his tormentors, and they sought amusement elsewhere. He looked about him now. But could not recognize the locality. He was within the city of London, that was all he knew. He moved on aimlessly, and in a little while the houses thinned and the passers by were infrequent. He bathed his bleeding feet in the brook which flowed then where Farrington Street now is, rested a few moments, then passed on, and presently came upon a great space with only a few scattered houses in it and a prodigious church. He recognized this church. Scaffoldings were about everywhere, and swarms of workmen, for it was undergoing elaborate repairs. The prince took heart at once. He felt that his troubles were at an end now. He said to himself, It is the ancient Grey Friars' church, which the king my father hath taken from the monks, and given for a home for ever, for poor and forsaken children, and new named it Christ's church. Right gladly will they serve the son of him who has done so generously by them, and the more that that son is himself as poor and as forlorn as any that be sheltered here this day, or ever shall be. He was soon in the midst of a crowd of boys who were running, jumping, playing at ball and leapfrog, and otherwise disporting themselves, and right noisily too. They were all dressed alike, and in the fashion which in that day prevailed among serving men and prentices. Footnote. Christ's Hospital Costume. It is most reasonable to regard the dress as copied from the costume of the citizens of London of that period, when long blue coats were the common habit of apprentices and serving men, and yellow stockings were generally worn. The coat fits closely to the body, but has loose sleeves, and beneath is worn a sleeveless yellow undercoat. Around the waist is a red leathern girdle. A clerical band round the collar, and a small flat black cap, about the size of a saucer, completes the costume. Tim's Curiosities of London. End of footnote. That is to say, each had on the crown of his head a flat black cap about the size of a saucer, which was not useful as a covering, it being of such scanty dimensions, neither was it ornamental. From beneath it the hair fell, unparted, to the middle of the forehead, and was cropped straight around. A clerical band at the neck, a blue gown that fitted closely and hung as low as the knees or lower, blue sleeves, a broad red belt, bright yellow stockings, gartered above the knees, low shoes with large metal buckles. It was a sufficiently ugly costume. The boys stopped their play and flocked about the prince, who said with native dignity, Good lads, say to your master that Edward, Prince of Wales, desireth speech with him. A great shout went up at this, and one rude fellow said, Marry, art thou his grace's messenger, beggar? The prince's face flushed with anger, and his ready hand flew to his hip, but there was nothing there. There was a storm of laughter, and one boy said, Didst mark that? He fancied he had a sword. Belike he is the prince himself. This sally brought more laughter. Poor Edward drew himself up proudly and said, I am the prince, and it ill beseemeth you that feed upon the king my father's bounty to use me so. This was vastly enjoyed as the laughter testified. The youth who had first spoken shouted to his comrades, Ho, swine, slaves, pensioners of his grace's princely father, where be your manners? Down on your marrow bones, all of ye. And do reverence to his kingly port and royal rags. With boisterous mirth they dropped upon their knees in a body and did mock homage to their prey. The prince spurned the nearest boy with his foot and said fiercely, Take thou that till the morrow come and I build thee a gibbet. Ah, but this was not a joke. This was going beyond fun. The laughter ceased on the instant and fury took its place. A dozen shouted, Hail him forth to the horse pond, to the horse pond. Where be the dogs? Ho there, lion! Ho, fangs! 
Then followed such a thing as England had never seen before, the sacred person of the heir to the throne, rudely buffeted by plebeian hands, and set upon and torn by dogs. As night drew to a close that day, the prince found himself far down in the close-built portion of the city. His body was bruised, his hands were bleeding, and his rags were all besmirched with mud. He wandered on and on, and grew more and more bewildered, and so tired and faint he could hardly drag one foot after the other. He had ceased to ask questions of any one, since they brought him only insult instead of information. He kept muttering to himself, O oh, full court, that is the name, if I can but find it, before my strength is wholly spent and I drop, then I am saved, for his people will take me to the palace, and prove that I am none of theirs, but the true prince, and I shall have mine own again. And now and then his mind reverted to his treatment by those rude Christ's hospital boys, and he said, When I am king, they shall not have bread and shelter only, but also teachings out of books, for a full belly is little worth where the mind is starved, and the heart. I will keep this diligently in my remembrance, that this day's lesson be not lost upon me, and my people suffer thereby. For learning softeneth the heart, and breedeth gentleness and charity. Footnote. It appears that Christ's Hospital was not originally founded as a school. Its object was to rescue children from the streets, to shelter, feed, clothe them, etc. Tim's Curiosities of London. End of footnote. The lights began to twinkle. It came on to rain. The wind rose, and a raw and gusty night set in. The houseless prince, the homeless heir to the throne of England, still moved on, drifting deeper into the maze of squalid alleys, where the swarming hives of poverty and misery were massed together. Suddenly a great drunken ruffian collared him, and said, "'Out to this time of night again! And hast thou brought a farthing home, I warrant me? If it be so, and I do not break all the bones in thy lean body, then am I not John Canty, but some other!' The prince twisted himself loose, unconsciously brushed his profane shoulder, and eagerly said, "'Oh, art his father truly? Sweet heaven, grant it be so! Then wilt thou fetch him away and restore me!' "'His father? I know not what thou meanst. I but know I am thy father, as thou shalt soon have cause to—' "'Oh, jest not, palter not, delay not. I am worn, I am wounded, I can bear no more. Take me to the king, my father, and he will make thee rich beyond thy wildest dreams. Believe me, man, believe me. I speak no lie, but only the truth. Put forth thy hand and save me. I am indeed the Prince of Wales." The man stared down, stupefied, upon the lad, then shook his head and muttered, "'Gone stark mad as any Tom o' Bedlam!' then collared him once more and said with a coarse laugh and an oath, <laughs> But mad or mad, I and thy grammar canty will soon find where the soft places in thy bones lie, or I'm no true man. With this he dragged the frantic and struggling prince away, and disappeared up a foul court, followed by a delighted and noisy swarm of human vermin. CHAPTER V. TOM AS A PATRICIAN Tom Canty, left alone in the prince's cabinet, made good use of his opportunity. He turned himself this way and that before the great mirror, admiring his finery, then walked away imitating the prince's high-bred carriage and still observing results in the glass. Next he drew the beautiful sword and bowed, kissing the blade and laying it across his breast, as he had seen a noble knight do, by way of salute, to the lieutenant of the tower five or six weeks before, when delivering the great lords of Norfolk and Surrey into his hands for captivity. Tom played with a jeweled dagger that hung upon his thigh. He examined the costly and exquisite ornaments of the room. He tried each of the sumptuous chairs, and thought how proud he would be if the offal court herd could only peep in and see him in his grandeur. He wondered if they would believe the marvellous tale he should tell when he got home, or if they would shake their heads and say his overtaxed imagination had at last upset his reason. At the end of half an hour it suddenly occurred to him that the prince was gone a long time. Then right away he began to feel lonely. Very soon he fell to listening and longing, and ceased to toy with the pretty things about him. He grew uneasy, then restless, then distressed. Suppose some one should come and catch him in the prince's clothes, and the prince not there to explain. 
Might they not hang him at once, and inquire into his case afterward? He had heard that the great were prompt about small matters. His fears rose higher and higher, and trembling he softly opened the door to the antechamber, resolved to fly and seek the prince, and through him protection and release. Six gorgeous gentlemen servants, and two young pages of high degree, clothed like butterflies, sprung to their feet and bowed low before him. He stepped quickly back and shut the door. He said, Oh, they mock at me! They will go and tell! Oh, why came I here to cast away my life? He walked up and down the floor, filled with nameless fears, listening, starting at every trifling sound. Presently the door swung open, and a silken page said, The Lady Jane Grey. The door closed, and a sweet young girl, richly clad, bounded toward him. But she stopped suddenly, and said in a distressed voice, Oh, what aileth thee, my lord? Tom's breath was nearly failing him, but he made shift to stammer out, Ah, be merciful thou! In sooth I am no lord, but only poor Tom Canty of Offal Court in the city. Prithee let me see the prince, and he will of his grace restore to me my rags, and let me hence unhurt. Oh, be thou merciful, and save me! By this time the boy was on his knees, and supplicating with his eyes and uplifted hands, as well as with his tongue. The young girl seemed horror-stricken. She cried out, "'Oh, my lord, on thy knees, and to me!' Then she fled away in fright, and Tom, smitten with despair, sank down, murmuring, "'There is no help, there is no hope. Now will they come and take me!' Whilst he lay there benumbed with terror, dreadful tidings were speeding through the palace. The whisper, for it was whispered always, flew from menial to menial, from lord to lady, down all the long corridors, from story to story, from saloon to saloon. The prince hath gone mad! The prince hath gone mad! Soon every saloon, every marble hall, had its groups of glittering lords and ladies, and other groups of dazzling lesser folk, talking earnestly together in whispers, and every face had in it dismay. Presently a splendid official came marching by these groups, making solemn proclamation, "'In the name of the King, let none list to this false and foolish matter upon pain of death, nor discuss the same, nor carry it abroad. In the name of the King!' The whispering ceased, as suddenly as if the whisperers had been stricken dumb. Soon there was a general buzz along the corridors of, "'The Prince! See, the Prince comes!' Poor Tom came slowly, walking past the low-bowing groups, trying to bow in return, and meekly gazing upon his strange surroundings with bewildered and pathetic eyes. Great nobles walked upon each side of him, making him lean upon them, and so steady his steps. Behind him followed the court physicians and some servants. Presently Tom found himself in a noble apartment of the palace, and heard the door close behind him. Around him stood those who had come with him. Before him— at a little distance, reclined a very large and very fat man, with a wide, pulpy face and a stern expression. His large head was very gray, and his whiskers, which he wore only around his face, like a frame, were gray also. His clothing was of rich stuff, but old and slightly frayed in places. One of his swollen legs had a pillow under it, and was wrapped in bandages. There was silence now, and there was no head there but was bent in reverence except this man's. This stern-countenanced invalid was the dread Henry the Eighth. He said, and his face grew gentle as he began to speak, "'How now, my lord Edward, my prince? Hast been minded to cousin me, the good king thy father, who loveth thee and kindly useth thee, with a sorry jest?' Poor Tom was listening as well as his dazed faculties would let him to the beginning of this speech, but when the words, Me, the good king, fell upon his ear, his face blanched, and he dropped as instantly upon his knees as if a shot had brought him there. Lifting up his hands, he exclaimed, Thou, the king, then am I undone indeed. This speech seemed to stun the king. His eyes wandered from face to face aimlessly, then rested bewildered upon the boy before him. Then he said in a tone of deep disappointment, "'Alack, I had believed the rumour disproportioned to the truth, but I fear me tis not so.' He breathed a heavy sigh, and said in a gentle voice, "'Come to thy father, child. Thou art not well.' Tom was assisted to his feet, and approached the majesty of England, humble and trembling. The king took the frightened face between his hands, 
and gazed earnestly and lovingly into it a while, as if seeking some grateful sign of returning reason there, then pressed the curly head against his breast and patted it tenderly. Presently he said, "'Dost not know thy father, child? Break not mine old heart. Say thou knowest me. Thou dost know me, dost thou not?' Yea, thou art my dread lord the king, whom God preserve. True, true, that is well. Be comforted. Tremble not so. There is none here would hurt thee. There is none here but loves thee. Thou art better now. Thy ill dream passeth. Is not so? And thou knowest thyself now also. Is not so? Thou wilt not miscall thyself again, as they say thou didst a little while agone. I pray thee of thy grace believe me. I did but speak the truth, most dread lord, for I am the meanest among thy subjects, being a pauper born, and tis by a sore mischance and accident I am here, albeit I was therein nothing blameful. I am but young to die, and thou canst save me with one little word. Oh, speak it, sir. Die? Talk not so, sweet prince. Peace, peace to thy troubled heart. Thou shalt not die. Tom dropped upon his knees with a glad cry. God requite thy mercy, O my king, and save thee long to bless thy land. Then, springing up, he turned a joyful face toward the two lords in waiting, and exclaimed, Thou heardst it! I am not to die. The king hath said it. There was no movement, save that all bowed with grave respect, but no one spoke. He hesitated, a little confused, then turned timidly toward the king, saying, I may go now? Go? Surely, if thou desireth. But why not tarry yet a little? Whither wouldst go? Tom dropped his eyes, and answered humbly, Peradventure I mistook, but I did think me free, and so was I moved to seek again in the kennel where I was born, and bred to misery, yet which harboureth my mother and my sisters, and so is home to me whereas these pomps and splendors whereunto I am not used. Oh, please you, sir, to let me go." The king was silent and thoughtful a while, and his face betrayed a growing distress and uneasiness. Presently he said, with something of hope in his voice, "'Perchance he is but mad upon this one strain, and hath his wits unmarred as toucheth other matters. God send it may be so. We will make trial. Then he asked Tom a question in Latin, and Tom answered him lamely in the same tongue. The king was delighted, and showed it. The lords and doctors manifested their gratification also. The king said, "'Twas not according to his schooling and ability, but showeth that his mind is but diseased, not stricken fatally. How say you, sir?' The physician addressed bowed low, and replied, "'It jumpeth with mine own conviction, sire, that thou hast divined aright. The king looked pleased with this encouragement, coming as it did from so excellent authority, and continued with good heart, "'Now, mark ye all, we will try him further.' He put a question to Tom in French. Tom stood silent a moment, embarrassed by having so many eyes centred upon him, then said diffidently, "'I have no knowledge of this tongue, so please your majesty.' The king fell back upon his couch. The attendants flew to his assistance, but he put them aside, and said, "'Trouble me not.' It is nothing but a scurvy faintness. Raise me. There, tis sufficient. Come hither, child. There, rest thy poor troubled head upon thy father's heart, and be at peace. Thou'lt soon be well. Tis but a passing fantasy. Fear thou not. Thou'lt soon be well. Then he turned toward the company. His gentle manner changed, and baleful lightnings began to play from his eyes. He said, List ye all! This, my son, is mad, but it is not permanent. Overstudy hath done this, and somewhat too much of confinement. Away with his books and teachers, see ye to it. Pleasure him with sports. Beguile him in wholesome ways, so that his health come again. He raised himself higher still, and went on with energy. He is mad, but he is my son and England's heir, and mad or sane still shall he reign. And hear ye further, and proclaim it. Whoso speaketh of his distemper, worketh against the peace and order of these realms, and shall to the gallows. Give me to drink, I burn, this sorrow sappeth my strength. There, take away the cup. Support me. There, that is well. 
Mad is he? Were he a thousand times mad, yet is he Prince of Wales, and I, the King, will confirm it. This very morrow shall he be installed in his princely dignity, in due and ancient form. Take instant order for it, my lord Hartford. One of the nobles knelt at the royal couch, and said, The King's Majesty knoweth that the hereditary great marshal of England lieth attained in the tower. It were not meet that one attained. Peace! Insult not mine ears with his hated name. Is this man to live for ever? Am I to be balked of my will? Is the prince to tarry uninstalled, because, forsooth, the realm lacketh an earl marshal free of treasonable taint, to invest him with his honours? No, by the splendour of God! Warn my Parliament to bring me Norfolk's doom before the sun rise again, else shall they answer for it grievously. Footnote. The Duke of Norfolk's condemnation commanded. The King was now approaching fast towards his end, and fearing lest Norfolk should escape him, he sent a message to the Commons, by which he desired them to hasten the bill, on pretence that Norfolk enjoyed the dignity of Earl Marshal, and it was necessary to appoint another, who might officiate at the ensuing ceremony of installing his son, Prince of Wales. Hume's History of England, Volume 3, page 307. End of footnote. Lord Hertford said, The King's will is law, and rising, returned to his former place. Gradually the wrath faded out of the old King's face, and he said, Kiss me, my Prince. There, what fearest thou? Am I not thy loving father? Thou art good to me, that am unworthy, O mighty and gracious Lord, that in truth I know, but, but it grieveth me to think of him that is to die, and— Ah, tis like thee, tis like thee, I know thy heart is still the same, even though thy mind hath suffered hurt, for thou wert ever of a gentle spirit. But this duke standeth between thee and thine honours. I will have another in his stead, that shall bring no taint to his great office. Comfort thee, my prince, trouble not thy poor head with this matter. But is it not I that speed him hence, my liege? How long might he not live but for me? Take no thought of him, my prince, he is not worthy. Kiss me once again, and go to thy trifles and amusements, for my malady distresseth me. I am a-weary, and would rest." Go with thine uncle Hertford and thy people, and come again when my body is refreshed. Tom, heavy-hearted, was conducted from the presence, for this last sentence was a death-blow to the hope he had cherished, that now he would be set free. Once more he heard the buzz of low voices exclaiming, The prince! The prince comes! His spirits sank lower and lower as he moved between the glittering files of bowing courtiers for he recognized that he was indeed a captive now, and might remain forever shut up in this gilded cage, a forlorn and friendless prince, except God in his mercy take pity on him and set him free. And turn where he would he seemed to see, floating in the air, the severed head and the remembered face of the great Duke of Norfolk, the eyes fixed on him reproachfully. His old dreams had been so pleasant! But this reality was so dreary. End of chapter 5